I'm sorry I missed the introduction, but I know Dennis. Mm -hmm. I, I missed the introduction, but Dennis Lim did a really good one, well, so I, mean, I was happy to answer any questions. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Okay. Yeah, well, uh, selectively <laughs> answer any questions. Okay, I will. I will start by a few, and then we can share with the audience. Okay, in English. <laughs> Um, is it, I mean, I was wondering how you picked Les Trois Gros as a restaurant, I mean, other than the fact that you're the same age as a restaurant, um, but it's... A it's older, actually. <laughs> okay, well, the legend goes you're the same. And I was wondering, out of all the amazing uh, culinary institutions in France, how did you get in touch with Les Trois Gros and why you picked that one in particular, which is also not located in Paris. Well, it, it was a sheer chance. Uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, I was freeloading at, uh, at various country houses of my friends in order to try and avoid COVID. And I stayed for a month with a friend of mine in Burgundy. And I wanted to thank him and his wife. Uh, and I looked in the Guide Michelin for a, three-star restaurant and there was one about an hour away so we went there for lunch and after lunch Cesar Trogo came out and worked the room as the, the chefs always do when he came over to our table and, uh, we talked for a bit and without planning to do so I sort of instinctively uh, the documentary filmmaker in me took over and I said would you I'm a documentary filmmaker, would you consider having a, a movie made uh, of the restaurant? And he said, uh, uh, let me talk to my father. And he came back 35 minutes later and said, why not? Uh, and then we exchanged some letters and uh, I went to visit them once and we drew up an agreement. And then I discovered uh, when I, uh, this spring when I showed them the film that he hadn't showed it to his father. His father wasn't there that day, but he'd looked me up on the internet and Wikipedia had given me the good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, so I, you know, thanks to Wikipedia, I, I got permission. I think it's more thanks to Wikipedia. It's mostly thanks to you. It's, it's really thanks for, to your previous work more than Wikipedia. Uh, because Wikipedia without you would not be any of any interest. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm very surprised. Are you that you in general of Wikipedia? Or? <laughs> no, <laughs> just you, Paige. <laughs> uh. You managed to get a reservation right there at Les Trois Gros, which I've been trying to go for, I don't know, 15 years. <laughs> so I'm only, I guess my Wikipedia page is not as good as yours. And also, uh, when you met with Caesar, who was working the room, then you met with uh, the father in a, in a subsequent visit? or uh, in a, a subsequent visit, a few months later, I met with Caesar and, and, uh, and, and Michel, okay. and Mary Pierre, the mother. You met the other one after? And uh, Leo, yeah, then I, I went over to meet Leo at, his, at the other restaurant, yeah. So how long did you, uh, when you decided to make the film and, and to shoot there, how long did it take before you could actually start shooting? And how did they give you permission to actually go in the kitchen? Because it not that very disruptive for three-star, like Michelin restaurant, to have someone filming and going around? I mean, it seems a very quiet level kitchen. Well, I, the, the Trois Gros are a very kind and generous family, and I don't say that just because they gave me permission. They're, they're really, uh, really nice people. And, uh, 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 you know, I obviously, uh, when we were shooting in the kitchen, we try to stay out of people's way. And I think by and large succeeded. Um, uh, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't start shooting till the spring of 2022 because I wanted it to be some respite in the COVID, which of course is never over. Uh, and um, I was there for, I think, I think seven, I can't remember, but I think seven weeks, I said nine earlier, but I think it was seven. Uh, 
Of, of shooting, every seven weeks they, of shooting they were open work? five days a week, and, and we were there every day, uh, five days a week for seven weeks. Okay. Did, so you, it means it was probably about 35 shooting days. Oh, yeah. Were you sleeping there? Hmm? Were you sleeping in the, in the hotel? No, 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 oh. it was too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping uh, they'll give there you... Was a, there was a and b about three minutes away. Uh, uh, Near Rouen, it's, it's not as exciting as sleeping in La, La Colline, but I guess it was a budget, uh, con it's a budget concession you have to do for the... Well, but the B&B &B &B was thing. nice. <laughs> uh, and and yeah. it, uh, there was some compensation because they invited us to eat with the chefs every day. So I, I, I ate at Trois Gros 70 times. Uh, uh, it's a figure I like repeating. Uh, you must be one of the person who ate at Les Trois Gros the most. Uh, you, you probably have a record for the Guinness Book record. of Records of yeah. eating there. Well, I, I'm so modest much. about it. <laughs> <laughs> was a budget, did you have a budget allocation to eat there or it was an invitation? Well, no, I, I had actually, uh, the budget was to eat elsewhere. Uh, but th this was free as well as being delicious. Uh, Were you looking for volunteers to help you in the shoot? <laughs> uh, no, I, I didn't want to share it with anybody. Um, I, I have a culinary question. It's uh, the cheese um, the plates. Uh, the cheese factory? Yeah, no, not the cheese factory. It's like when they bring the cart with the chills. Mm -hmm. did, you, did they also give you this when you were shooting? Sorry. Did you, were you able to have access to the cheese cart when yeah. you were shooting? Well, uh, or not? Well, I mean, well, obviously I had access in the film. You see it. You see there are two sequences, the cheese cart in the film, and when we ate there, they they only gave us a choice of three or four cheeses every night. May I ask if you have any favorite cheese? Yeah. <laughs> it's too private. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, you, men you mentioned that it was, you were very respectful of the way you were working in the kitchen since people are working and it's not possible to stop um, actually when we're working to, for you to shoot. So how large of a crew did you have when you're in the kitchen and walking around the room and how convenient was it there, for, there were, for them? There were four of us. Okay. But... But we, you know, uh, we were, you know, we tried to be respectful and careful, but it was like uh, an awkward ballet uh, because the, as you see in the film, the chefs are moving very quickly and we had to move very quickly to stay out of their way and at the same time get the shots. Uh, but we, uh, they, they never complained, nor did we. Mm -hmm. okay. In terms of having access to the people who are eating in the restaurant, w would, were people like aware of you working there and just like well, shooting the, and talking? The, 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 uh, I, uh, a, a lot of the people in the restaurant uh, I approached uh, because uh, uh, you know, I, I assumed if they could eat at Trois Gros, they also could afford good lawyers. Uh, 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 and uh, so, and some of the people were old customers, and Michel or Cesar approached them on my behalf. But nobody said no, much to my surprise. Mary Pierre Trois Gros was initially very concerned about the restaurant, and she said, uh, she could always tell when a man was there with his mistress because he was nice to her. Well, hmm. <laughs> I assume you didn't try to go in that direction of shooting illegal couples because you don't know what could happen when you show the film. Oh, you don't want to show to shoot illegal couples. You know, when we show the film, it could be divorces with expensive lawyers as well. But, um, 
Did you make a conscious decision when you, as a French person watching the film and seeing the international clientele, you do feel a difference how people approach the restaurants and the food and the wine and the way they talk about it. Is it something that you were thinking about when you're shooting? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it would be a mistake for me to make cultural generalizations uh, because it, it's, you know, first of all, it's a small sample, and I, also I don't like to make generalizations. But I must say I couldn't resist the way some of the Americans uh, 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 responded to the wine and to the... That, that was that was my point, <laughs> but I, I wasn't I wasn't sure if it was just personal, if you but if you were thinking about it when you were shooting or editing, because you you thinking shot, about what? How you're showing some Americans who are little? I would say well, but not you know I, I don't you know I don't believe the Americans are re necessarily representative Americans, as the French are necessarily representative French. I mean the just people. Who can afford to eat at an expensive yeah, restaurant? Of course, yeah. uh, but you, you shot more than what you're showing. Oh, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in the in the seven weeks we were there, we shot probably 150 hours, and as you know, as I indicated earlier, it's only it's a mere four hours. So the ratio, the shooting ratio, is a little less than 40 to one. Did you show the film to people from Les Trois Gros? Uh, finished? Well, I showed it to the Trois Gros family, uh, and then at the end of November, it's going to open in Paris on December 20th, and at the end of November, I'm going to Rouen and going to show it to the people who work in the restaurant and, and, their, and their suppliers. I mean, basically to the people who are in the film. Is there an open invitation? Is there an open invitation for from people here? Well, there's an open invitation for the people who are in the film. Oh. Uh. <laughs> this very, you're very cruel. <laughs> you're tempting <laughs> us with so much amazing food. Well, but food. You, you, you can go anytime you want. <laughs> no, I've been uh. trying to go for years. I cannot you, get a reservation. You mean they were full every time? They're always full. It's like you have to book like months and months and months ahead of time. Well, for yes. consideration, I could help you. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> uh. Um, I know there's a lot of fans of your work in the audience, and if people have questions for Mr. Weizmann, we have, okay, yes. yes. If but you don't mind speaking up because I am a bit deaf. <laughs> no, but we, we have microphone, correct? Yes, so we have microphone in the audience um, for, where, here, yes. I'm curious to know, just in the edit itself, with that many hours of footage and just bringing it down to, e even at four hours long, how, how do you make decisions on what stays, what goes, what's going through your mind and through the editing process? Well, you're asking me uh, how I edit, and, and uh, uh, I hope the explanation isn't too long. Uh, when I come back from the shoot, uh, uh, maybe a week or two afterwards, I start to edit. And I look at all the footage, uh, all 150 hours. And that takes me about six weeks. In the course of looking at it, I make notes about the sequences. Uh, and at the end of that six weeks, I put aside as sequences I'm not particularly interested in about half the material. And then I simply start editing sequences that interest me, that I think might make it into the film from that remaining 50%, or roughly 50%. That can take me six or eight months. At the end of that six or eight months, uh, uh, I, I have rough versions of all the so-called candidate sequences. Uh, in, in order to arrive at those rough versions, I have to deceive myself into thinking that I understand what's going on in each sequence. Uh, I have to think that I understand it in order to make the decision whether or not I want to consider using the sequence, and then how I'm going to reduce it from its original length, because almost every sequence in the film 
ex e even the sequences of the uh, uh, of you know the pots in the kitchen, uh, uh, the, the frying of the uh, uh, the kidneys are much longer. In some cases, uh, fifteen or twenty minutes or thirty minutes longer than than what you see in the film. So I have to think I understand what's going on. To, in order to make, not only make the choice for the sequence, but how to cut it to a usable form. And then I have to figure out how to place it where the sequence fits in the structure of the film. But, I mean, the, the basic aspect of editing is trying to understand what's happening in the case of the kitchen, the various uh, uh, various uh, stages of the cooking, uh, but often uh, when people are talking to each other, uh, you have to, I have to think that I understand what they're saying and why they're saying it and what the general impact of their choice of words and gesture and body movements may be. So after at the end of that six or eight months, I have a group of uh, sequences, so-called candidate sequences, and then in three or four days, I make the first assembly, because at that point, I know uh, the material, or I think I know the material extremely well, and I can work out the first tentative structure. Then when I do that, it takes me about another six or eight weeks to work out the final structure. And then when I think the film is finished, I go back and look at all the rushes, in the case of uh, Trois Gros, all 150 hours, to make sure there's nothing that uh, I initially rejected that might be useful uh, because of the other choices that I made. And I always find a short sequence or a transitional sequence or a cutaway, uh, more than one cutaway, that's useful to solve a problem that I think I didn't adequately solve. I think we have time for one final question, and there's, there's still a microphone going around. The light is very bright, so you, you, I can't really see. Yes, there, sorry. Hi, um, hi, Fred. I know in the past that you recorded your own sound and would often direct the cameraman with the shotgun microphone as to where you wanted to move or what you wanted to cover. And I'm curious to know what it's like for you to work now with somebody else recording sound and how you manage that and direct the shooting without having the uh, microphone to shove into his frame to say, over here. Well, I mean, I'm not quite sure I heard the question. I'm, I rec you were shooting the sound for you. Yeah. I, in fact, uh, this film is the first one uh, where I didn't record the sound. Yeah. So how was it for you in terms of... Well, I, 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 I was using... I used a viewer, uh, and, you know, I didn't... I was... Uh, I've had some health problems, so I didn't have the strength to run around with the sound equipment. Uh, um, but... Uh, I was still able to tell the cameraman what I want shot by because I was looking at the viewer and he was, I, I had one eye on the viewer and one eye on him and he had one eye on the viewfinder and one eye on me. And we, and we have little signals that we use, like pointing. Uh, 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 uh. That, that's a very original signal. Hmm? <laughs> it's a very original yeah. signal. Was your answer? Uh, was your uh, question answered? Yeah. Yeah. Was it okay or was it frustrating? Was it okay or frustrating? Mm. Was it okay or frustrating to work with? Uh, okay or frustrating to work with someone else on the sound? No, it was all right. I mean, uh, I mean, it was just necessary. Necessary, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.